So to navigate uh, the currents of disruption, you build better teams. Uh, you guys are a relatively recently formed team. Uh, Edith joined the board at Slack in February, uh, but a pretty productive team so far. So what makes a team better? What are the characteristics of a team that can survive a time of uh, crazy technological change? I'll go first. Um, I think about it like this often. If you divide the world into two classes, just for the sake of argument, the bosses on the one hand and the workers on the other, and then you ask the workers what they would like, it's to be trusted and to be respected and to be able to trust the people they work with, um, to understand what the objectives are, how their performance will be evaluated, to know what decisions they can make, and if they're not able to make a decision, who is able to make that decision, and a, and a list, list of things like that. And people also like to be productive and effective. When you are, you're excited to come into work in the morning, and when you're not, you kind of dread it. Um, but then you ask the bosses what they would like, and it's more or less exactly the same things using different language. So we speak about accountability um, instead of autonomy on the other side. Almost every team um, has the, the, the limiting factor on its performance is the degree of alignment on it as opposed to the, the talent. So assuming that you're hiring for some baseline level of talent, the difference between the best and the worst performing individuals might be like this, but the difference between the best and the worst performing teams is um, orders of magnitude greater. So I think that that list of things that I mentioned from the workers is where I would start. Mm -hmm. And the more you're able to get that aligned, the more you're able to get that on the same page, the more you're gonna push that team uh, that team performance up, but does it, is it also a matter of, of cohesion? You've got people feeling better respected and, and better, uh, just sort of better valued and better recognized for what they're good at. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, all companies to be successful have a common thread, and that is talented people. Uh, every organization is looking for talented people, but the real success comes when you can bring those individuals who come forward to work in your organization with a unique and interesting, valuable perspective and you create an environment for them where they can perform to their attention, uh, potential. That's really what is important in creating a real talent-driven organization. And it's really the organization's leadership responsibility to create that environment, a culture where people uh, can express their opinions, their perspectives, can take risks, smart risks. Um, it's because that it's in that environment where people are able to get a little uncomfortable in a situation where ideas really flow, where things really happen. So you were on, you were Goldman Sachs for uh, more than 20 years, so you, you're in an environment in the finance industry where to take a risk uh, and to uh, risk failure has different stakes and there's, there's more, uh, it's, it's a different environment than the sort of fail fast world of technology. When you guys first connected, what did you find that you, uh, was it hard to make those worlds communicate across, uh, uh, across a sort of gap of culture or did you have, uh, you know, did you find shreds of common philosophy? Well, at the end of the day, if you get people to really move in the same direction and perform to the goals of an organization, uh, you're going you're gonna to do well. Uh, in financial services, particularly in a firm that's got a history of 150 years, uh, you, know, you really are responsible to stay cutting edge and innovate, um, to stay relevant in a global marketplace that's changing all the time. The challenge and perhaps the opportunity is you have to do that staying true to the core ethos of your culture uh, and the cultural tenets of a Goldman Sachs are things that would probably ring true for everyone in this room. You know, prioritizing, client, prioritizing clients' interests, integrity, honesty, teamwork, real ownership of inclusivity and diversity within the organization. One of the things that struck me the most is I got to know uh, Slack, the organization, and Stuart as its, as its founder, is that the words are not that different. Um, the difference, however, is that we are in more of a position to be disrupted um, versus Slack is in the position to uh, really disrupt and change and enhance the way people work. And that growth mindset that requires innovation, you know, quite frankly, puts everybody sort of in the, in the front of their, their seats um, because if you don't do it, you won't be relevant, you won't survive. It's, a, it's not about survival at Goldman Sachs, it's about continuing to enhance and move forward. Mm -hmm. Having been personally disrupted by Slack, like a lot of my colleagues at, uh, at, at Time Inc., uh, it, it, we incorporated it around the time uh, that I joined Fortune, uh, when it was still part of Time Inc., and uh, it was a very unfamiliar way to communicate until all of a sudden it wasn't. Uh, so it's been, it's been interesting to kind of learn, learn that, 
that technological experience. I'm curious to know, once you've got the people in place, uh, got the right team in place, how does technology, not just yours but any technology, kind of help you uh, get the most out of them, nurture their talent, help them develop, and help them want to stay? Uh, I think it's a good question. So I mean, I'm very conscious that a lot of the things that both Edith and I were talking about uh, are on the softer side. And I think that is important when you think about the question of technological disruption. Um, it almost always requires some change on the organization side. And that can be market disruption. It can be technological disruption. It can be a change in, in what customers need. Uh, Edith used the phrase pointing in the same direction. And I remember, I wish I could remember who it was, but I remember maybe a decade ago having um, someone draw this diagram with a bunch of circles on a whiteboard, and inside the circles there were arrows, and the arrows are pointing in all different directions. And the point was, when you're not aligned, it doesn't matter how much energy people exert or how much individual productivity there is, because they're, they're pushing in different directions and you don't really go anywhere. Especially when there's a big disruptive change, um, technology can come into play and help people keep aligned mostly just with transparency. And there's only been, you know, there's been enormous strides in individual worker productivity over the last four decades or so, but it's been 30 years of wondering where is the productivity impact of all this technology. And I think the limiting factor is really um, at the organizational level. You'll, Stanley Crystal's talking later tonight, so I'm sure there'll be some team of teams kind of conversation. Um, the organizational level and at the team level. And the biggest thing is the shared consciousness. So any of you who've read that book know that one of the solutions from, from them was like, a, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like a 7,000 person, six hour long video call. And that's one way to achieve shared consciousness. And there's a definite use of technology. Um, <laughs> shared semi-consciousness yeah, exactly. as, as I tune out. Um, I think, you know, it's something that Slack, other technology, definitely doesn't solve for any, any leader or any manager, but I think it's a really effective instrument to get that kind of transparency for people to have a little bit of consciousness of what their peers are working on, um, to be literally looking at the same thing. And um, over the last 60 years, let's say, email has been the only real step forward um, until, until relatively recently. Um, that change, I think, we'll see um, over the next decade is gonna be pretty dramatic. I mean, within a decade, everyone will be using Slack or something like that because the advantages are just so big. Does that instant communication channel make uh, leadership and leaders more accountable to the rank and file? You know, if, if uh, I know that if a reporter can ping me as an editor any second on Slack, I'm, I'm gonna be more inclined to respond, to explain, to, to elaborate. So how do you find that works in, in your context? Um, well, we have a channel called Exec AMA. So AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. Um, and there's a lot of questions that are answered there. There's a lot more going on than just that one question and that one answer, though. I think there's um, opportunities almost every time a question is answered to not just get the information out, but to signal something that you think is important. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you think risk taking is important or innovation is important, then sig you know owning up to some um, risk that was taken either in your individual capacity or, or by the company that didn't work out, but from which you learned um, can be a really important signal. The responsiveness one, I struggle with a little bit more. Um, I think there's, there's an inversion to that where if the conversation's happening in a place that's accessible to everyone, there's much less of a need for kind of the manual effort of communication, like this daily stand-up meeting or the status report, or explicitly like capturing some information and pushing it to someone because they can just look and see what's going on, and that's a really powerful change. Mm. Edith, you were talking about early on, uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe before you even joined Slack, going to a kind of company, a, a company-wide in-person face-to-face meeting, and and how uh, you felt like maybe the. Can you tell me a little bit more, more about the Sure. That so um, one of the things that I um, really focused on is, as I was thinking about expanding sort of my horizon of what future of work would look like was spending time at organizations who were really on the cutting edge and had the opportunity to spend some time at Slack. And it struck me that the, the concept of bring all your people together and have conversations, dialogues around important things at the, at the company was a really good idea. And you know, I could have walked away and said, well, of course they can do it. You know, they don't have 40,000 people. But honestly, that was kind of an excuse. The reality was that what it did was it really broke down a lot of the hierarchical ba um, barriers that exist. Um, it also helped that people didn't go back to you know, offices with doors, that people work in a more open framework. And there are all sorts of technology-enabled ways of connecting via Slack 
but it was a real example for me as to how um, humanity and real human interaction was actually um, more important now than it had ever been. Uh, Stuart commented earlier about some of the things we're talking about being soft skills. I would suggest that that may have been the case in the past because of a of a important focus on you know getting at the data and understanding the drivers of decision making. But we've heard a lot today, and you're going to hear more. We're going to hear more tomorrow about how data and getting data and analyzing it is something that over time technology is really going to own. So at the core, what's going to happen, I would suggest, is that humanity and one's ability to have human experiences like uh, expression, communication, empathy, um, idea development are going to become more important. And things like stand-ups are going to be more important. Being authentic leaders and having real conversations and listening is going to be more important. Uh, because that's what's going to set an organization apart from another that, quite frankly, is just focused on the technical aspects of things. Are you starting to see some of those changes, some of that adaptation in finance? You know, an industry that, that I tend to think of as more hierarchical, a little more uh, uh, top-down in its leadership. Well, you know, any firm, but I can just comment on the one that, that I um, most recently have been involved in for 20 years. You know, there are 40,000 people. We hire thousands of people every year. If you look at the demographics of the firm, and I don't think this is so unusual, 70% uh, of the firm, probably more now, are in the you know, 22 to 35 demographic. If you look at the leadership construct of the firm, let's just say that's not the case. And so therefore, we really, um, I, I really felt strongly leading the people activities at the firm that we really need to get very honest with ourselves with respect to what the talent equation looked like going forward and how to really, again, create this environment where people could perform to their potential. Smart, technologically enabled, passionate about making an impact, um, willing to work hard, but also insisting upon working smart. You know, this argument of, you know, I got coffee, you should do it, I did this, you should do it, forget it. No interest in that. And so I do believe that, you know, what's happened is that, you know, there's been awakening on, on things that we have to really do to continue to be a place where people want to do well. Um, and going back to something that Stuart said earlier, you know, motivate um, uh, people to, to, to be part of the success, successful equation of the organization. Thanks. Uh, I want to remind everybody you're welcome to, we welcome questions from the audience, and I'll keep an eye out for our mic runners and our paddle holders. Um, but while we, uh, and I believe we do have a question in the back. Uh, oh, sorry about that. But while we wait for a question, I actually had a, a kind of a gimmicky question uh, for you, Stuart, but it feels like in, in this context it's, it's meaningful, which is, What's the most sort of surprising and mind-opening thing someone has ever done at the company Slack using the tool Slack? Something. I, I wish we had platform. these questions in advance. Um. <laughs> I wish I thought of it before two minutes ago, but here we are. Um, something that comes to mind. Yeah. So I mean, I got I got something. That's, fortunately, it's not as surprising or humorous as I would like, um, <laughs> but uh, there's a, an innovation that spread really quickly, which was you can have a direct message conversation with anyone. So uh, I have one with all of my direct reports. April Underwood is one of my direct reports. She runs product um, and a frequent speaker at your events. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was her or someone else, but we created a separate channel for agendas with, uh, with those people. So instead of having them mixed in with a regular course of conversation, you just drop bullet points into that channel. Every time you actually get together, you have a nice neat list of bullet points for the things you want to discuss. And I wish that was more funny. <laughs> well, actually, uh, having had the experience of going across it was several real, though, pages, Stuart. yeah, and having gone across several pages of Slack conversation to try to pull out some key moments with uh, with people that, that I report to, I think that's uh, that's may I steal that idea? Sure. Okay. Do people use Slack at Goldman Sachs or an equivalent? No. 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 S starting to now. Starting Un to. under the under the radar. But so here's there's the some thing. compliance issues, yeah, right? Here's there's the some documentation thing. issues. Uh, and I say no as and highlighted it as a real opportunity. Because you know, one of the challenges with financial services is the, that it, it and, and quite frankly, requirements of financial services is that it's highly regulated. And as a result, uh, information sharing is something that's monitored, captured, blah, 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 blah. The reality, though, as a result, is that um, I would say we have not, um, we've had to push ourselves to be more assertive to do things that we will look back on in two or three years and go, ugh, mm -hmm. I can't believe we waited so long to figure out how to do X. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that a collaboration tool like Slack is one of those examples. When I think about the feedback that we would get from our people year after year after year about the challenges of getting work done, you know, the emails, the presentation, the this, the that, was really cramping people's ability uh, to, to not only get their jobs done, but also to, to hear and know where think great ideas were happening within the company. So I think it's just a matter of time, quite frankly, because you're not going to be able to stay relevant if you don't have access to ideas from other people within the organization. And a tool like Slack really enables the company to do that. And the agility to adapt. As the Absolutely. Absolutely. Have us a question here at the table in the front. Could you uh, let us know who you are and where you're from? Yes, Adam. I'm Adam Lashinsky with Fortune. And um, to both of you, in the in the spirit of, of playing devil's advocate, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of teamwork and also of hiring good people. But Edith, in the case of Goldman, uh, I, my, the overall arching question is, where does stra how important is strategy versus these subjects that you two have been discussing? So for example, if in the last 15, 20 years, Goldman hadn't made a very strong move into trading, proprietary trading, and emphasized it. It wouldn't matter how good your teams were. And, and Stuart, if you hadn't developed, if, if your product development hadn't nailed the moment, it wouldn't matter how good your teams were or your, or your hiring was. So strategy versus these other topics. And this will, yeah, and this will, I'm sorry, and this will probably be your, your last word on uh, as, as our time kind of takes down, but maybe a, the, the, the relative importance of strategy versus... Well, I would argue that we wouldn't have been able to implement the strategy if it were not for the culture, right? So it's not an either or. They're very, very connected. Um, you know, could you, ha could we, could the firm have been able to you know, develop the new markets, become more global, connect more technologically, et cetera, if in fact we didn't have a culture of, of, in, of exploration, innovation, and taking risk. Um, not only market risks, but the risks of saying, hey, here's an opportunity that I think is coming around the corner. We better go after it because our clients really want us to. Too. Strategy, culture, they're very much connected. Stuart, final thoughts on that? Yeah, and I can see the timer, so I'll be respectful. <laughs> um, you will, um, or those of you who don't live in Chicago, will go to O'Hare and take a plane somewhere, and you'll walk past a bookstore in the airport, and there'll be two kinds of business books. One is like great leaders and their amazing strategic decisions, and the other one is kind of individual worker productivity tips and how to get more out of your time, life hacks, and, and stuff like that. But there's this vast thing in the middle, which, um, as you just pointed to, is at least as important, I would argue more important, because that great decision requires the implementation, and whether it's like Blockbuster versus the internet, when you know a very disadvantaged position, or a great company going through a positive change like Adobe um, switching to a cloud model versus packaged software, the organization's ability to make that kind of change with the minimum amount of disruption internally, with the minimum amount of you know, people lost and, and wasted time and effort, um, is the hallmark of success. And very much a function of being agile. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time. Stuart Butterfield, Edith Cooper, it's been a Excellent. pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you.